On this special edition of Independent Sources, Enter West Africa, we focus on the African nation of Ghana. What's behind the country's economic boom? The double-edged sword of China's influence on the country's textile industry. And why are Ghanaians robbing graves for ancient beads? Those stories and more tonight on this special edition of Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. I'm Abby Ashola. And I'm Diana Ravinka. Tonight we begin a two part special on West Africa that we're calling Enter West Africa. Over the next two weeks, we'll visit two emerging economies in the region, namely Ghana and Nigeria, where our colleague Abby Ishola traces her heritage. Thanks, Gary. While in Africa, I focused on several stories from the two countries. Both Ghana and Nigeria are rich in culture natural resources, and industries headed by young Africans leading the way with some transformative ideas. But as West Africa thrives in many areas, it still struggles with old demons. I hope to capture that dichotomy in my reports, whether looking at one entrepreneur's efforts to make dark-skinned dolls popular in Nigeria or the impact of counterfeit Chinese imports on Ghana's textile industry. And that's where we begin tonight, in Ghana, the first sub-Saharan African country to gain independence from Britain. That was in 1957. The country is about the size of the state of Oregon. Just over 50% of Ghana's gross domestic product comes from the service sector. Agriculture accounts for nearly a third and industry for 20%. During the 1970s and 80s, the country faced great political instability, but it has since rebounded. Over the last 25 years, Ghana has emerged as one of the strongest economies in West Africa, driven in part by massive investment from China. I spoke with Razin McClymont about how Ghana has been able to become the newest jewel in Africa's crown. Rosalind, about 25 years ago or so, Ghana was better known in West Africa as a place that sends refugees to the, re to the region. And in the 90s, Ghana began to change economically and to now where we routinely find stories about Ghana's economy in the Wall Street Journal. What sparked this turnaround? A number of things happened. Um, Ghana was in an economic morass for a long time, as you rightfully said, but still it was growing. It was a growing economy. Um, the refugees who fled to the United Kingdom and to the United States, of course, took up residence there, became uh, uh, exposed to those systems. And so what you have is partly a return of some of those, ed those refugees, so-called refugees, who are now educated, educated in the sense of exposure. Of course, some went to schools and acquired all the experience, the degrees, those credentials, and so on. But you also had economic forces at play here. Um, Ghana is an agricultural, mainly agricultural cocoa, society. Uh, one of the cocoa, largest exactly. producers in the world. Yes, and certainly gold, of course, bauxite. And as commodity prices rose on those, on, on those items, Ghana was able to increase its revenue earnings. And then you had the incident that, that we were just alluding to before we got on air, some of the, uh, the, the occurrences under the Rawlings regime, where people sort of said, enough was enough. You had the engagement with the International Monetary Fund under the Rawlings regime, which brought about some very harsh prescriptions. That, too, people said, enough was enough. Uh, they did not like that experience at all. And then in came, after Rawlings, in came an administration that began to turn things around. You began to look at fiscal policy. There was more emphasis on education. There was more emphasis on agricultural expansion, expanding the agricultural sector. There were all these, these domestic investments that, that began to turn things around. And also, once the credit worthiness of Ghana began to increase as the fiscal policies kicked in, then you had more investment coming in. You had more money coming in. And then, of course, 
course, you have the current regime, the current administration. <laughs> yeah, I mean, speaking of regime, you mentioned Jerry Rollins, who yes. was a lieutenant, yes. Air Force lieutenant, who took over and is somewhat credited for sparking this turnaround, albeit a bit controversial. Yes, albeit a bit controversial, you know, and, 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 and we don't want to go into the execution yeah, no, no, of this yeah, it's, it's, it's so. really It's really not yeah. that germane to the discussion. Yeah. But the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the role of China in, in the Ghanaian economy. What role is China playing there? China has invested, one of its biggest investments to date is the, um, is the, the dam, the hydroelectric dam at Bui which is not only going to help Ghana out with its own struggling grid, but it may even help Ghana export energy, energy. to neighboring countries. That is huge. Uh, uh, manufacturing, the textile industry has suffered a, a huge blow. However, the textile industry, revitalizing the textile industry, is part of the Better Ghana agenda, which China has been very, very helpful for, with its concessionary loans, with its investments in those key how, areas. How much, how much investment in terms of dollars are we talking about here? We're talking about billions. In 2007, Ghana, the Ghana, de uh, sorry, China Development Bank set up a fund for investment in Ghana, and that was a one, it was a billion dollars, at least a billion dollar fund, just maybe slightly over a billion dollars. That was back then. Today, the investments are, you have, uh, I think that dam that I talked about, Bui Dam, that is a, it's a uh, six, $340 million project, if I have my numbers right. But it's the kind of, of, of multi billion dollar investment in various key projects that are essential in the Ghanaian view of improving the country's economy. Thank you very much, Razin, for a wonderful conversation about one of my favorite places in the world, Ghana. Razin McClamont, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It's one of my favorite places, too. Still to come on our Independent Sources special, we hear more about troubles in Ghana's textile industry. To be a great dad is the most important job in a man's life, but it doesn't have to be hard. All it takes is a few minutes of your time because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Thanks for staying tuned to our very special Independent Sources focusing on Ghana. Earlier, we talked about what's driving Ghana's growth. We saw how Chinese investment was helping the country, but as I found out, China may be giving to Ghana with one hand and taking away with the other. Ghana's once booming textile industry is on the verge of total collapse. One of the biggest problems the sector faces is unfair competition from cheap pirated fabrics being smuggled into Ghana from China. Abi Shola visited one of the four remaining factories in Ghana that manufactures the country's iconic colorful wax prints to find out where the industry stands. Gideon Ashiagbor's future at his job hangs in the balance. After 10 years of working at Akosombo Textiles Limited in Ghana, the 33-year-old married father of two is one of thousands of textile workers in jeopardy of being laid off. If the, if the factory closed down, personally, it would be hell for me. Because I'm a textile technician, that's my field. Akusumbo Textiles Limited, or ATL, is one of four remaining textile factories in Ghana that produces the country's iconic wax prints. In the mid-70s, there were 40 factories that employed over 25,000 people. Today, there are less than 3,000 employees throughout the industry. The textile trade here has suffered for two main reasons. One is the sale of secondhand clothing from overseas. Then there's the major threat of pirated prints being smuggled into Ghana from China. The logos are the same. And even the standard board logos are even used. Now this is the original Akosomo textiles print, it here. Now, sometimes they use the same label no difference. Importers smuggle the pirated garments from China in through neighboring countries like Togo. Market workers purchase them, then sell them to consumers at a much lower price than the cloth made in Ghana. China-made fabrics are cheaper because the Chinese government subsidizes the country's textile exports. And since many of the print designs are plagiarized, 
Counterfeiters don't need to pay people to come up with fresh ideas. Abraham Kumsen, leader of the Textiles Workers Union in Ghana, calls the competition unfair. He's been fighting to correct the problem since the late 80s when it began. I will blame government for bad policies because it is not only the industry owners that are suffering. The state loses a lot of money. One, these people invade taxes. Two, they cause massive unemployment. It's estimated that Ghana loses about 20 million CDs annually due to the illicit textiles. That's $13 million. The government recently responded by setting up a task force made up of leaders in the industry, including Kumsen. He and his team are hoping to weed the problem out by burning illegal garments they seize from shop owners. Shops like this one in Accra, Ghana's capital city, have closed down as a result. Some Ghanaian shop owners say they should be allowed to sell made in China textiles because they're almost half the price of textiles made in factories in Ghana. <laughs> A reduction in the price of textiles can only happen if the Ghanaian government is willing to subsidize the industry, but that seems unlikely. In the meantime, Gideon Ashiagbor and thousands of others are left wondering what the future holds. I have my wife and my children, and I'm taking care of them. ATL is paying me to take care of them. So if ATL should close down and I go home, it will be very difficult. We are praying it shouldn't happen. But if it should happen and we get home, it will be very, very difficult. For independent sources, Abby Ashola. Counterfeit prints are not only hurting Ghana's textile industry, they're having a similar effect all over West Africa. With me in studio to discuss the significant history of these prints is Catherine McKinley, author of the book Indigo, In Search of the Color That Seduced the World. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Tell us about um, a little bit about something that you wrote in the book, precisely the history and the cultural relevance of uh, wax prints in mm -hmm. Ghana. Well, wax prints have an origin in the early 1800s. They were originally brought to Ghana by African troops who were serving in Indonesia and in the colonies that neighbored Indonesia. Um, there was a market and a lot of interest in wearing them. The style of dress was very similar to um, traditional Ghanaian dress, a kind of toga-like wearing. And so there was always a market there. And then ships that were passing from Indonesia and refueling or restocking on the coast of Africa were selling them and, in fact, trading them for, for slaves. So there's a long history of companies that were trading these things in Ghana. And they're, they're important to the culture because the various designs were given names and given meaning by the women that trade them and wear them. So a pattern that has eyes on, them, on it may mean something like my rival's eye or when I go out, when my husband goes out, I go out. So they were given these kind of proverbial names names that had social meaning and were a way to comment on the world. Now, with these uh, counterfeit feet, uh, prints, is there mm -hmm. a risk, perhaps, of uh, these patterns being altered? Yes, the designs, the designs have always traditionally been altered. They've kind of recycled designs. You see elements of designs from the 1800s that survive and are played with and then come back in their original form. But what's happening now is the designs are homogenizing. They're moving closer and closer to just kind of abstractions that don't have any meaning per se, that don't speak to the culture and to cultural ideas and to the, the meaning and the use of cloth in African society. There have been uh, reports of, uh, of uh, these uh, counterfeit prints um, having uh, harmful dyes mm -hmm. in, in them. Can you speak to that? Yes, um, well, even with the Dutch fabrics that are the highest quality, there's always been a problem with um, trichlorothene. It, it's 
around the factory, it's harmful to um, respiration, it's harmful to the environment, it seeps into water supplies. And that, so that's always been a concern, even with the Dutch factories, who are working at the highest standard. But a lot of the Chinese imports and even other cloths that are produced in Ghana use trichlor, um, misuse the chemical and use other chemicals that, that are more toxic. And so for even the wearer, it's leaching into the skin. And to what extent are people aware of these risks? They're not aware at all. They're not aware at all. Young people in Ghana and mm -hmm. Africa in general are embracing mm -hmm. native uh, clothing and mm -hmm. are incorporating it in, in their everyday wear. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that, um, the, this, this new fashion renaissance, if you will, that's uh -huh. taking place and the timing of it? I think it, it's, it's come and gone over the years. I've been traveling to Ghana since 1991. In the early 90s, everybody was wearing European-style clothing. And then there was a kind of revival at the end of the 90s. And then I think the present boom has something to do with the discovery of oil and kind of national sense of pride. And um, it's a relatively stable political situation. There's, there are a lot of good feelings. So I think there's a kind of embrace of Africanness and African clothing. But at the same time, the cloth that people are wearing is homogenizing and it's coming closer and closer to Western designs. And then you see the Western market here moving closer and closer to what we call, tri what they're calling tribal wear. And um, if you look at the two designs together, they, they look more and more like each other and less and less like what the cloths were historically. And you said that this um, uh, fashion uh, renaissance, this interest in traditional patterns has come and gone mm -hmm. uh, along the years. Uh, uh, this time around, do you hope that it would save the textile industry or where is it all going? I, it's hard to say where it's going. It's certainly there's a, a real sea change because Vlisco and some of the wax companies are fighting back against the Chinese, and I think they're finally effective. When I went to the Vlisco plant in Holland, I guess three years ago, they said that their sales were down almost 70 percent, and now they're trying to move into a kind of luxury brand. They're catering to a very specific audience, and they're raising the prices of the cloth. And so what's happening is with the woman that was interviewed who says that, you know, we can't afford, we love to sell Akasombo, but we can't afford it. Those claws are going towards a market outside of Ghana, which can afford higher prices. And so they're in effect disappearing there and moving further into markets here. Catherine McKinley, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Ghana's textile industry is not only facing competition from these counterfeit prints we just talked about, Used clothes shipped to the country from Europe and America have become so popular over the years, the trade has led to the collapse of a large chunk of the country's textile sector. Abby visited the largest used clothing market in Accra, Ghana's capital city, to find out if the country's second-hand clothing trade has been worth the burden. In the Kantamanto market in Ghana's capital city, Accra, you'll find pounds and pounds of pre-owned merchandise sitting under the mild sun. They are items people from the United States and Europe donated to their local charities. Here in Ghana, they are for sale. <laughs> Ghanaians call the goods obroni wewu, which means white man's deads. Most of the pieces come here in bundles like this through dealers who purchase them from charities overseas. Items that are torn or faded are sent to the back area to be sewn, dyed, and washed. From there, they are sold to customers here at Cantonment Hope, a place also known as the bend-down market, since customers do just that to select from a pile. The bend-down market here in Accra is one of the cheapest places to buy clothes. For example, a man can buy a pair of dress pants for 10 CDs, which is less than about $7. It's a benefit that has also become a burden. The used clothing trade has become so popular that it stopped Ghana's production of items like underwear, blankets, socks, and suiting material since the mid-90s. Ghana's once bustling textile industry used to employ over 20,000 workers. Today, the industry employs less than 3,000 people. 
Leaders from the sector argue that the Ghanaian government hasn't done enough to regulate how much of the Western world's hand-me-downs are allowed in. The panties all are even brought here and people buy, claiming that it is cheap, it's affordable, you see. But our governments have responsibility to control some of these things. But it's not always possible because of the interests of uh, politicians. So they see this is black, they say it's white. That's how, you know, the economies of Africa, you know, continue to suffer. Last March, Ghana's government banned the sale of used underwear, but they're still being smuggled in and sold. Despite the demand for foreign secondhand merchandise, many dealers here at Cantonment Toe say business for them is rocky, since most of the items are unwearable and competition is steep. By midday, this man clutches the only profit he's made, two CDs, a little over a dollar. If, if I go up, help me and I finish selling that day, I'll get about, say, let me say that, I'll get about, say, 400 or 500. But at times, if the, if the goose is not good, you lose. billions of In Ghana's textile industry, there are no clear winners, even with some merchants struggling to make a profit here at Cantamento. The trade has become such an integral part of Ghanaian society, it shows no signs of letting up. For independent sources, Abby Ishola. Stay with us. When we come back, we learn why ancient beads are being exhumed from graves in Ghana. Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. Ancient beads are more valuable to Ghanaians than diamonds may be to Westerners. Beads made from glass and precious metals symbolize wealth and status. More importantly, they have a deeper cultural meaning. In this report, Abby explores Ghana's history with beads and how the market for them has shifted from elders to young contemporary Ghanaians. Every Thursday morning, bead lovers and traders flock to this market in Kofori Dua, Ghana. Here, sellers work on stringing their latest designs while shoppers hunt for new trinkets amidst a rainbow of merchandise. Mohammed Ibrahim, a second generation bead trader, says the market is a distinct part of Ghana's history. For the beads market, I think it aged back more than 100 years. But it wasn't this very one. It started in a village very close to the, this very town called Kofredia. The lasting legacy of the marketplace is a reflection of how important beads are in Ghanaian society. One group called the Krobo piled them on as a sign of wealth during this cultural ceremony, marking the passage of girls into womanhood. For decades, Beads have been worn on special occasions like weddings and funerals. Kati Torda, bead designer and founder of the Ghana Bead Society, says from recycled glass to Ghanaian brass, each type has its own story that weaves deeply into Ghana's cultural identity. What Ghanaians didn't have stories like Romans and Greeks about gold, they had it about beads. The sources and the, the mystery. These beads are found where the earth, rainbow meets the earth. It's like do you need more beautiful story than that? Or this bead is the excrement of the moon. So, all right, sounds funny. And then this bead, only a magician can wear because it attracts lightning. So, cool. It's like, you know, it's mythology. That mythology and adoration has come with a price. Ancient beads like Italian-produced Chevron and Millifiori arrived in West Africa around the 17th century. They were then bartered for goods and people during the transatlantic slave trade. Since then, they've remained iconic here in Ghana, so much so that one tablet can cost about $200. The hefty price tag has even led insatiable traders to rob old burial grounds where wealthy Ghanaians have been laid to rest. 
When you look for the old graves, it's where you can find the oldies. So people go and study graves that have been lying for more than 30, 40 years. And then they loot it. Sometimes they don't see the body, but they found the beast and they collect. The Ghanaian government has since cracked down on grave looting while urging people not to bury their dead with valuables. This as the demand for beads remains high locally and has shifted to a new demographic. In Ghana, beads were once typically worn by old chiefs and elders, but now bead designers are creating more contemporary styles that are appealing more to younger consumers. It's like today we the young ones, we even wait more than the elderly people because I don't know, it has become something like fashion for us, even if we dress and we're going out to wear it. These days is ethnic fashion. Young Ghanaians are conscious about who they are. They like to wear their fabric in a new way, a new cut. You know, fashion designers are using Ghanaian fabrics now to create contemporary fashion and dress contemporary Ghanaians. And so they turn back to beads too. Traders say their next step is to create a bigger demand for Ghanaian beads outside of Africa. For Independent Sources, Abby Ashola. Finally tonight, we'll learn a little bit about New York's Ghanaian community. Earlier, we mentioned that Ghana was a British colony until 1957. Judith Escalona was at the recent Independence Day celebration in Yonkers. Ghanaians from all over New York City gathered in Yonkers to commemorate the 55th year of Ghana's independence from Britain. It's one of two key celebrations. The other is when Ghanaians gather to celebrate their American citizenship on the 4th of July. Now, 4th of July, when you come around Yankee Stadium, Mulali Park, you get over three to 4,000 Ghanaians. The large wave of Ghanaians came to the U.S. in the 1980s, though others arrived earlier. Prior to the late 80s, there was um, famine um, in, in, in all of West Africa, but it really hit Ghana hard. And also, this was during the military rule, so people were finding their ways to Nigeria, some were going to, you know, London. Many also sought refuge in the U.S. Like many immigrants, Ghanaians were seeking a better life and a chance to further their education. The majority of immigrants that come from West Africa, specifically Ghana, which is where we come from, are mostly middle class. Al-Haji Mohamed Marda is the president of the Yan Kasa Association that helps Ghanaians of all ethnicities and religions assimilate to American life. He says the number of Ghanaians in New York far exceeds the 2010 census count. The last census had the Ghanaian community about five to 6,000 but that's just the registered uh, number. But I believe it's probably 10 times more. Ivy Rose Quarche, executive secretary of the National Council of Ghanaian Associations, agrees. She estimates the population is closer to 50,000, the majority of whom are Christians and Muslims. Even way back in Ghana, the relationship between the Muslims and the East Christians is very cordial. We haven't experienced any rifts most Ghanaians moved to the Bronx, where the greatest concentration of them currently lives. Most of uh, Ghanaians are professionals. Most work, some of them work in the hospitals. Doctors, we have about almost 10,000 10, Ghanaian doctors in, the, in New York alone. And the hotels, and also local businesses. Though most Ghanaians have had great success in the U.S., a fast-growing economy at home is drawing many of them back. After they've gotten the degree, the, color, uh, the uh, education that they need, and decide to go back home. From somebody who has been here for the past quite a few years, I think the opportunities for the women is more uh, accessible than the men, our counterparts. Those who remain, like the people gathered here tonight, see a bright future, hoping someday there'll be a Ghanaian councilman or women representing them in government. I'm Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. That's our special look at Ghana this week. Thanks for staying tuned. You can learn more about my travels to West Africa by visiting the website ayashola.com slash enter West Africa. Join us again next week when we focus on the giant of Africa, Nigeria. Until then, be independent-minded.